So that's how we should uh, approach that. Lock up the criminals and then leave the church to deal with doctrinal issues. So, yes, you have given us uh, a, a description of uh, what a new prophetic church is and how it looks like. And uh, one of the things that it's quite evident is the number of attendants. You know, uh, myself being more into Baptist, you know, it can be dry from Sunday to Sunday in terms of at attendance. But then when it comes to NPC, new prophetic churches, uh, the attendance quite, you know, astonishing. There's, there's quite a good number of attendants from Sunday to Sunday. And, uh, yeah, so could you just give us maybe uh, what are some of the method or things that the leaders use in terms of uh, attracting this uh, attendance within their churches? which is not typically seen within, you know, the Dutch Reformed, uh, the Presbyterians and other denominations. And not just uh, a certain type of group, they get to attract the younger ones, uh, the youthful ones, the older ones, just everyone, basically. Yes, thank you, sir, for the question. Yeah, um... When you look at these churches, um, I can just give a bit of a background. When you look at the pre-Christian religions that were very much uh, contextual in addressing the challenges in Africa and uh, how Christianity came and the messenger being um, Western missionaries. And when the Western missionaries came, they did away with some of uh, religious and cultural practices. And that alone uh, tempered with the issue of contextuality and also um, moved some Africans away from the uh, Christian church. And when you look at Pentecostal movement, when the rise of Pentecostalism in Africa is also based on that reason, that they are able to bring balance between what is Christianity and what are African cultural practices. If that is done at a five out of 10 in classical Pentecostal churches, new prophetic churches are doing that 10 out of 10. So if you come as an African, they have studied you, they know what are your challenges, they know what are your needs, and therefore they bring the issue of Pentecostal spirituality and intersect it with African spirituality. And hence, the Africans, it doesn't matter how critical we are to these churches, 
but an African person, given their challenges and what they grow, they go through and daily life, they are able to uh, follow this kind of churches in search of solutions to their problems. So hence, scholars have found that that is one of the reasons why new prophetic churches attract large numbers um, in their gatherings. That is one. And then secondly, and again, it's it, it, uh, very related to my first point. If you check the practice of prophecy, it's not uh, the first time that is done by these new prophet, prophetic churches. Pra prophecy has been practiced in African traditional religions, in African initiated churches, and so forth. So when these churches come, they modernize the practice of prophecy, which an African is already familiar with. They have already received the prophecy in ATRs and prophecy in I A A A AICs. So when they come to NPCs, they are already used to the practice of prophecy. And Africans, uh, Percy, they love uh, prophecy. They want to know uh, what is it? What is it wrong with me? Why are things not going uh, my way? And therefore, they go to these churches. You and I can observe and see that some of the prophecies are just performed. They are just staged. Uh, but the people who are there, they have hope. Because a president mm. will stand and say there are no jobs, but a prophet will stand and say, you're mm. going to receive mm. this, mm. you're going to receive mm. that. Mm. So an African person has a hope if, uh, in the prophet, even more than uh, the politician. So that is what is happening with these churches. And uh, my third point will be the their appeal for people who are struggling uh, with issues of African uh, spirituality. Remember that in Africa, there is a connection between what people go through and the spirit world. So everything else is connected to the spirit world. If you are sick, even just headache, they will say, uh, uh, you are being bewitched, or there is a demon causing that headache, even when you are unemployed, or even the inequalities that exist in South Africa, for example. So there's always this connection to the spirit world. And therefore, when these churches come with a concept of divine healing, a concept of deliverance. So it somehow become relevant to that connection in the spirit world to say you need deliverance because someone bewitched you. It's a misfortune. It's a generational curse and so on and so forth. So they present the problem so that you will go to them for a solution. And those three reasons are some of the reasons why these churches will be full as compared to uh, Pastor Percy, who is just preaching uh, the word. And, and um, for these prophets, they go beyond conventional preaching. They talk deliverance. They talk healing. They talk uh, African spirituality without saying it without saying we are helping you the same way a traditional healer is helping you, the same way an Inyanga is helping you, a Sangoma is helping you. Uh, they don't say it, but when we study these things, we are able to draw 
parallelism. Mm, mm, mm. Well, thank you for such a detailed explanation as to why people are drawn into uh, the new prophetic churches. Uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, one of the most important member, uh, highly respected member at the church, at the new prophetic church, it is the leader. Uh, it is the one who has the vision, sort of like he's the one who is uh, directing and shifting everything within the church. There's this sort of like, you know, uh, I would uh, be tempted to call it a prideful way of uh, running the church. Would you agree with me? Well, how would you kind of like uh, describe the typical leader within the new prophetic church? Because you see them, you know, with their shiny clothes. You see them with their expensive cars. You see them just being so authoritative within the church, you know, as to say, what I say must be dollar, you know. Yes, uh, and uh, by raising that question, uh, Percy, you have just uh, helped us again to make a distinction between these churches mm -hmm. and other uh, churches, even within the same tradition. Uh, because uh, you and I's idea of a pastor is someone who's uh, very yeah, humble, yeah. Um, is someone who is found within the community, praying with people, burying, and uh, conducting weddings, and so on. But a prophet in new prophetic churches, it's a different spiritual or church leader. Because, uh, because of the, the following that they have, they have... Uh, moved away from that level of just being a typical pastor to a level of a celebrity. So the same way a, a celebrity will boast about their uh, clothing, their vehicles, their mansions, it is the same way that a, a prophet will will do because um whatever they are talking about whatever they are preaching they want to convince the mind that indeed what they are preaching they have become uh, to tempt you to become like them so when they talk prosperity when they talk wealth, mm -hmm. when they talk oh. affluence, uh, and so on, they want to exemplify that so that it will be easy for you to give away your 5,000 rand, your 10,000 rand, or at times even your whole pension. Because you see mm -hmm. this pastor who's a celebrity, who's driving uh, this kind of a, a, a vehicle, and lives in this mansion, and therefore you think that it is worth it to take my whole pension fund and give uh, to the men of God. So it is, it is, it, it is the psy psychology of religion, because when doing that, you are able to convince the mind. Uh, there are some that do own those. Others will even go to a, an extent of borrowing, uh, an extent of using other people's houses just to show, uh, to show up that they have this and that. But in reality, some of them, they are not that rich. But it's just to work with the mind of an African to say, uh, God can do this. Look at me, he has done it for me, and therefore he can do for it for you as well. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, that's that's some truth. Uh, indeed, you have been studying, uh, you know, 
just how these churches operate, uh, especially from the leadership point of view. Uh, could we now get into a typical member who just comes on a Sunday, who just comes on a Sunday, uh, find their chairs, and then sit? Uh, if we look at that individual, what could be some of the dangers of finding themselves seated uh, under such a leader uh, within the new prophetic church? I think you have started highlighting on some of the dangers such as uh, manipulations and uh, you know uh, unmet expectations. Uh, what could be some of mm, the dangers of just being within a new prophetic church? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Yeah, you can become very uh, vulnerable because uh, some of our uh, people that attend these churches, they are very ignorant. Uh, they are not studying the word for themselves mm -hmm. to find mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. what scriptures are saying about different aspects of a, a ecclesiology, of liturgy, issues mm -hmm. of giving, issues of tithing and so on and so forth so you can be very much uh, vulnerable in the sense that you will do things not knowing what you are getting yourself into we have heard about like i said of members in these churches who would give their uh, last money and so on that they could be using to uh, educate their children and for their own upkeep and by so saying i'm not saying we shouldn't give in church we should but um, as much as we do it with emotions uh, being led by the spirit we should also do it uh, with understanding mm. and knowing what am i getting myself into F uh, to me it appears that some of the followers they did not know what they were doing when they were giving and uh, when they were just, it's more like, a, like you said, manipulation. Um, it's like they are manipulated and so on. So um, you can be very much uh, vulnerable. You can be manipulated and so on. Hence the <clears throat> importance of studying the weight of God for your own good, for your own knowledge, so that you will know uh, when a prophet stands and says something, you will have to verify it in scripture and so on. The, the mm -hmm. Bible says in the witnesses of two or three, the word shall be established. It means that when I say something, uh, Percy, don't just take it as the truth. You need to hear from uh, the other two people and then you can indeed say, this I accept as truth. So, but the way I, I have observed uh, these uh, churches is that people just go uh, into these churches. So sitting in such a church on a Sunday uh, service or on a as a member of that church on a regular basis, you could uh, be a vulnerable member. You could do things that you don't understand. But then also, um, there are some of the pastors and churches that have been involved in cultist practices. Some are not uh, are more than cultists cultistic uh, practices they are more ritualistic uh, uh, practices and so on so you could find yourself being hooked in some of the practices that you don't know yourself um, because you have joined a, a church that is practicing such and then 
my last point is that some of the people were separated with their families uh, when a, such pastors and prophets want to take control of you they separate you from family from friends and so on so they isolate you and take you away from the rest of your family members so you can find yourself uh, in that situation where there is no family around where uh, your parents are not around where it is just you because of following uh, such churches mm, 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 mm. yeah i think uh another one of the most dangerous thing and which is quite sad is that you know uh, sitting in under such a church you get to be i think you said it you get to be deprived from the word of god you know you get to be deprived of what is the gospel you get to be deprived as to how can you be delivered from the most important thing that you should be delivered from and which is from your sin you know just talking to most of members around uh, these churches and you ask them, you know, how did you become a Christian? You know, how, how can you ensure that when you die, you have everlasting life, you get to be accepted, you know, in, in, in heaven. And the, the answers that they give, if they ever give, are quite shocking. So I think the, it's one of the most saddest thing that there is not so much that they are getting of what the gospel is, how it came into be, and the importance of it. You know, uh, uh, what what they get, it's rather more of a prosperity gospel sort of, and which is something that I would love for you to talk about, like how does prosperity gospel look like within a new prophetic church and also just the commercialization that takes place within those churches. Could you please touch, touch on the prosperity gospel and the commercialization that take place uh, within NPC? Yes, no, thank you very much. And you are touching on a very important uh, point whereby we need to take uh, followers of Christ back to the basics to teach them Christ, uh, to teach them the Gospels, the basic uh, doctrines, and, and so on. And once we are rooted there, we can grow to other levels in our walk with God. So other than just being taught a theology of prosperity. So in my other works, I have referred to these churches as uh, the gospel in the mix or the movement in the mix. And earlier on, I have shown that they take from African traditional religions, they take from African initiated churches, but mm -hmm. also they take from uh, American Pentecostalism, which basically is a prosperity theology of uh, uh, E.W. Kenyon and uh, lately of Creflo Dollar and other uh, gospel ministers. So they teach prosperity, um, but then the teaching on prosperity sometimes is done at the expense of people learning uh, about Christ. So in other words, each time we teach about ma the materiality of religion and materialism, um, the, the, there is a shift away from focusing on Christ to focusing on things. And that is the danger of a prosperity uh, gospel, particularly when it is overemphasized. 
Because indeed, uh, Percy, you want to prosper. You want to live a good life. But prosperity theology becomes wrong when it is overemphasized and when materialism and materiality of religion takes the place of Christ. To go to church now, focusing on what you can receive and also in displaying what you have as opposed to other people who don't have that which you have. So it makes church to be a place where we compete about material things rather than being a place where people receive the word, where people grow spiritually, where people are helped in other aspects of life. There are so many uh, that people are going through uh, particularly in these last five years uh, since COVID-19, uh, the war in Ukraine and Russia and so on. So there are so many challenges. But then we just go to church instead of addressing contextual issues. We just talk about the car, the house, the monies and all of that. So it is wrong when it's overemphasized over uh, what Christ is. So by definition, a, pro a prosperity theology, prosperity gospel, it's a gospel that says to you, salvation and the, the work of Christ on the cross, it's not only uh, bringing healing to you and so on, it should be able to make you prosper in other aspects of life. And where I see it, uh, the foundational teaching of a prosperity gospel, uh, its intention is not wrong, but I think that when it is overemphasized, uh, it becomes wrong. Because in a country or a continent where majority don't have jobs, majority, uh, uh, so, uh, some did not even finish uh, school, others did not finish uh, tertiary qualifications. In that context, that message of prospering, if applied correctly, it might work. Teachings on social development, teachings on sustainability, teachings on entrepreneurship. On that angle, it can work in a continent and country like ours. However, it is hijacked. That message is hijacked by pastors to self-enrich themselves, uh, to, to enrich themselves. Um, because whatever people are giving, uh, in, in, with, with the quest to prosper, they find themselves not prospering. And only the pastor or the leader is prospering. The rest of the people are not. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I think I wanted to ask about uh, some of the clear, crystal clear uh, biblical principle and teachings which kind of refutes the practices, the beliefs that are held within these churches. Uh, I think you have alluded to uh, some of them as to saying that, you know, the, the center of the church should be Christ rather than material things and uh, rather than prosperity and uh, we need to go back to the basic of what Christianity is all about, being fed with the word. Uh, do you have maybe <clears throat> even more of some of the biblical passages, stories, uh, principles, which, you know, refutes the, the practices that we commonly see within these churches? 
Yes, and I think uh, it is important to mention that uh, when a believer comes to Christ, we we should see uh, the sufficiency of Christ in redeeming uh, an African believer. Because that's where the problem is. That's where the it is basically the foundation of new prophetic churches theology. And they come to you and say, it's not enough for you to say you are born again. It's not enough for you to say, I follow Christ. Therefore, you need something extra. And that is where we open a door for the materiality of religion, for the objectification of the gospel, the commercialization, the commodification of the gospel. Because a prophet is able to convince you that uh, accepting Christ alone, it's not enough. You have to have an, an anointing oil somewhere. You need to have an anointed water uh, somewhere to help you to be delivered. Now, when, let's go to scriptures. Uh, the the uh, Second Corinthians 5.70, it says, If any man, so this man might be in Jamaica, this man might be in America, this man might be in Australia, this man might be in London, this man might be in Amamaila uh, or Wutopwa in Africa. But mm -hmm. the scripture says, any man, so it's not talking about an American or a European. If any man be in Christ, he is new. So all things, whatever case that you used to have before coming to Christ, when you come to him, you are new. That's what the scripture promises you. You should believe that, that text to say, I am new. Therefore, I do not have to do something extra for me to complete my salvation. So what Christ has mm -hmm. done on the cross uh, gives me a complete sa salvation. It is the sufficiency uh, of Christ. Then we go to 2 Corinthians, uh, yes, Corinthians 3 verse 17 it says that where the spirit of god is there is a deliverance it means that the basic theology of your deliverance of my deliverance is the holy spirit meaning that when the holy spirit lives in a believer that believer cannot be possessed by other demons including uh, generational cases and so on. So mm -hmm. those are some of the uh, biblical theology that we can use to correct uh, the, uh, the theologies that encourages people to engage in all this uh, materiality and so on. It is because they do not see the sufficiency of Christ. In a nutshell, uh, Percy, we, uh, mm. the answer to all these malpractices, it is the, the sufficiency of Christ. So mm. in our tradition, we do not emphasize that. Uh, as, as Pentecostals, we always see the need to help Christ is like mm -hmm. Christ mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. very powerful when he's in America or when he's in <laughs> Europe.
But when he comes to Africa, the Christ in Africa needs some help. Uh, he, he, he is not sufficient to deal with an African problem. So when you look yeah. at it, it's not the problem of the gospel itself. It's not the problem of uh, what Christ has done. It goes back to what we said in the beginning. The theology that the Western missionary brought and the kind of training they receive, which, by the way, continues to be taught in our universities, in our seminaries, even today, whereby we produce a pastor. When a demon manifests, uh, John Beatty in one of the in one of his books mentions this, that a demon would manifest, and that pastor with a wrong Western theology will not be able to deal with that demon. So it is not because Christ cannot uh, help an African. It is the theologies that have occupied our pastors and the new prophetic churches have seen the gap. That's why they come and say, no, you need more help. Uh, in the church that you used to belong to, they didn't deal with your problem. I can deal with your problem. Not knowing that in that mm. very same church where you are, if you can call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. You don't need the materiality of religion. Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, a lot of amens to what you have said. Indeed, we should uh, look to Christ and Christ alone for our salvation, you know, and our satisfaction also. Understanding that he has purchased us with his precious blood, sufficient to cleanse us all from our sins and all our anxieties, stress, and burdens. As he says that, you know, anyone who is burdened, let him come to me, you know. Uh, he is a gently, <coughs> he is a gently savior. So, yeah, what an encouragement uh, that is, you know, and also just uh, understanding that he has torn the curtain in two, you know. Just now we are even called priesthood in, in, in the New Testament, meaning that we have a direct access to God. So you do not need anyone, you know, just to access the throne of grace. You just, uh, Christ has done that. Christ is the interceder. There's no one who should uh, be a stumbling block. You know, your prayers can be heard as much as the pastor or someone whom you regard as a spiritual father. Your prayers, God can hear them through uh, the grace which is provided in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then uh, in most churches, it is not so. You know, we have touched on it that we do see a lot of abuses, uh, you know, whether it be mental abuses, sometimes it even manifests through physical abuse. You know, there have been a lot of reports in the news. Uh, yeah, you probably have heard something which is shocking, something that which you do not expect to be happening within the body of Christ. But unfortunately, this has happened. Uh, so I just, with, with, with that, I just want to ask, you know, uh, based on, on uh, first, first Peter chapter 2, where, where it says that, you know, God has instituted the government to uh, reward those who do good and punish those who do evil. When we come to South Africa, the government, of, of course, being ANC, uh, through all the reports, reports through all the, the incidents of abuse and all those stories, what has the government done so far? Uh, has it been successful? You know, uh, or maybe they've been prohibited by the freedom of speech. You know, just could you please tell us what has the government done so far with all the abuses that we have seen over the years? Yes, thank you, sir. Um, I think first of all, we indeed you are correct to point to various abuses. Uh, various practices, I have called them 
unusual practices. And again, as a Pentecostal, having grown up in church, uh, got born again at the age of 14, and, uh, and became a pastor, I observed and said to myself, this is not common. These are unusual practices. So, but then those practices need to be uh, categorized appropriately um, because there are some that are criminal. Uh, there are others that are doctrinal and uh, others that refer to issues of gender-based violence. And lastly, there are practices that tamper with human rights. Mm -hmm. So when you look at those kind of practices, indeed the government has a role to play. So for any criminal act, whether I'm a pastor, a professor, a politician, a medical doctor, or any other professional, when you engage in a criminal act, uh, the law must take it, its course. So there shouldn't be a special inquiry. There shouldn't be a commission. Uh, even our uh, CRL commission, yeah. you know, it, it, it's, um, it's not necessary to involve them in a criminal act. That is uh, the act that needs the police uh, to investigate and so on. And some issues that relates to gender-based violence. And then in South Africa, we have a Human Rights Commission. In some of the practices that we saw on television, on newspapers, and so on, the Human Rights Commission should be able to come in and say, although this person has agreed uh, to eat grass, it, it's an inhuman to do so. Um, mm -hmm. Although they have agreed that you step on them in the name of religion, it is inhuman to do so. So that is how a government through its law enforcement agency, government through its rights commission can come in. But now let's come to issues that relate to church doctrine. Uh, uh, that's where I've argued in my other works to say uh, it, it would be wrong for a government to say we are going to regulate religion. And I have explained this is where the government will have challenges. Percy prefers praying while standing and I want to pray while kneeling. Uh, you pray midnight, I pray in the morning. And, and, just, and many other examples that I can give. So when it comes to issues of doctrine and some of the practices, although they involve human rights, if you look at the issue of grass and the issue of petrol, um, the pastor said, you have been eating bread and, and wine as symbols of the Holy Communion. Then he comes and he says, the snake and the, the grass replaces the bread and the wine. So right there, you are dealing with a doc issues of doctrine where we can easily, without calling police, without calling the human rights as, as mm. pastors, if we have ecumenical bodies, if mm. the, that pastor is able to sit with me as a pastor or any other pastor, 
we open the scriptures and say this is doctrinally wrong because uh, the scriptures mentions uh, the bread and the wine particularly and therefore you cannot use any other thing so th th those are some of the discussions that we should be having uh, here in in south africa but uh, mm. to answer your question precisely we need to differentiate uh, differ uh, differentiate those different practices and see where should government come in and mm. where should government withdraw because the mm. competency of the church cannot be replaced by the competency of the government so the the example that i've just given to you now someone without theology cannot be able to show you the difference and you will just point and say that is wrong without even uh, bringing uh, reasons and explaining why you say it is wrong so that's how we should uh, approach that lock up the criminals and then leave the church to deal with doctrinal issues yeah 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 and it can get to be a hard practice to apply uh, within a new prophetic church since you know there's no sort of like accountability because for us to correct such things you know uh, there needs to be uh, accountability i think ecclesiastes 4 says that you know uh, two is better than one so that when the other one falls the other can sort of like uh, redeem the person but we there's no way such a practice can be done if it is only you know a one man uh, building his own kingdom so yeah i think there's also that that, that uh, challenge but then Correct. Uh, yeah if i can just come in there Percy, uh, before yeah, you please, ask please, this please. question yes um i think you are raising a very crucial point uh, it is a question also in my uh, research work uh, mm. in the in the in the article that i referred to um and we should be able to say that a, a government must provide an oversight role. They are already doing this in other sectors. A, a, when a government provides an oversight role, when they provide an administrative support for churches, we shouldn't see that as regulation. For example, if churches say, if government say, any other church that is opened should be opened under this umbrella or this administrative organization. That is not necessarily a regulation, is to support a churches. Um, and therefore, we should be able to say, whether you are Pentecostal or Catholic and so on, you need to belong to a certain ecumenical body. And if you, as Percy, you are saying, no, I cannot belong to SACC, it's irrelevant for me, then you should be able to come together with those that are relevant to you and form an ecumenical body that will make you accountable. That I fully uh, support, and you are correct to say some of them as lone rangers, as people who are just working alone there, they continue with these acts and not be accountable. And we feel like right there, the government should come in. And the question is how? So a government should provide support. So the government must not see church as enemy. Because there are things that government can do through church. If you are rolling out certain programs, church as located in communities is very much relevant. If you talk about giving food during COVID-19 to people who did not have food, 
as some politicians stole food and so on. If the politicians worked with churches in communities, it, would, it might have been a different story. I'm not saying uh, pastors will not steal, but I'm just saying there will be some form of accountability and also churches are in communities. So uh, we need to ask ourselves a question. What is the government's interest in the church? Is it government coming to judge the church? It is government coming only when the church is going wrong? Or do we see church as a partner to help deal with social ills? And I think if we look at church with the latter lenses, I think we will be able to deal with some of the challenges that we have uh, here in South mm. Africa. In the UK, for example, churches are registered uh, as charity organizations. Uh, but there, there will be no government official to say, how are you preaching? How are you laying hands? How are you doing this and that? They, they just say, register as a charity organization because... We will give you support. And for every pound that you invest, a government will give you 25 pence. So that is how government is supporting church, not to just see church as a demon uh, and demonize church in that way. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, uh, thank you for such an helpful information uh, relating to the church and the government. But uh, I think in closing, I would appreciate for sort of like to internalize the issues. I think for now we sort of like, you know, externalizing the issues by saying that there is manipulations that happens through the, the leaderships of the church and saying maybe that the government is not doing enough. But then would you push back to someone who says that even the individual who is going to this church is not someone who's innocent, is guilty. He is or she is looking for what she is getting out of there. I think you even said something on your uh, one of your articles as I was reading that, you know, uh, if one of those leaders say that, you know, you're about to die, the person will be like, oh, you know, go deeper, papa, you know, sort of like this sort of like highlight sort of an uh, internal issue rather than, you know, is the manipulation, is the lack of uh, accountability, it's a lack of government uh, responsibility, but the person himself or the person herself, she is also guilty of all of this that is happening. Would you push back on that? What comment uh, would you make on, on, on such a view? Yes, um, I think that is that will be a valid point uh, because as much as there is a the corruptee, there is a corrupter, and uh, both they are uh, involved in 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 corruption. So if a traffic officer stops me on the road and say, uh, I need cold drink. Mm -hmm. uh, as, I, as the person giving him the cold drink, I'm guilty as mm -hmm. the one who mm -hmm. demands that cold drink. So both of us, mm -hmm. we have responsibility in correcting these uh, malpractices in society. And therefore, I, can, I, I have an option to tell the traffic officer to say no, Give me a proper ticket, uh, I will pay for it, or to say to him, I will report you to uh, the higher office. And even there, even when he gives you a ticket, you still have remedy to go to court and say, no, I didn't have a, a, a driver's license, but I am licensed to be on the road. So here is my license. I just didn't have it at that time. And you will find that at the court, maybe you don't even pay anything uh, closer to that cold drink, the 50 rand, the 100 rand, and so on. So I'm giving that example to say 
uh, as society, we have a responsibility to educate ourselves. Um, we have a responsibility to know Christ for ourselves because mm -hmm. we play a bigger role in the prevalence, in the growth of these churches that seem not to be responsible and so on. We can ask you ourselves a big question. Uh, I beg you, uh, Percy, let's ask ourselves a big question. Would a churches like this thrive elsewhere other than in Africa? We should ask ourselves that question. To say, if I am a pastor, giving people snakes, giving people grass, doing that. If I go to Los Angeles, will I, will I still be a pastor? If I go to London, if I go to Melbourne, will I still be a pastor there? And in my view, having traveled to those uh, cities and countries, I think the answer is no. They will arrest you quickly or you will not even have support from the people. Uh, you will not have people following you uh, because they can read, they can see that no, a uh, Percy is not carrying the real one. Uh, having said that, there are uh, malpractices of religion in those spaces as well. Uh, mm -hmm. but they are very minimal. They are not like the way they happen here in our continent. And therefore, we have a responsibility. We, have, we are uh, in supporting this kind of changes. We are uh, playing a bigger role uh, and so on. And therefore, when we sit back and check and uh, be able to self-correct, be able to read scriptures, be able to study, uh, we, we might be able to discern. And therefore, in one of my articles, mm. I suggest the theology of discernment, whereby as a believer, I must be able to say no. It can be. Uh, uh, this is inconsistent with scriptures. This is not how yeah. I know uh, giving or whatever aspects of church uh, in that, at that time. So we should be able to move in discernment. And mm. when we do, we will be able to help deal with these issues. Thank you, sir. Mm, 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 mm. Wonderful stuff, right there. Wonderful stuff. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, you know, though there's still a lot of information, details that we could uh, touch in, I think uh, for today we should uh, call it a day. Uh, I think we have run over an hour now. So, uh, yes, that was uh, Professor Solomon all the way from uh, university. A wonderful discussion on uh, the new prophetic churches. Uh, say, so I hope you know we could uh, do more of this. I could see that you know you're so passionate about uh, Pentecostalism, about churches, and uh, the people of South Africa. So, you know, I'm looking forward if uh, the Lord wills that we could uh, engage more on other topics and uh, uh, continue to sharpen the people who need knowledge. Yes, uh, as we said in the beginning that uh, the, uh, Professor Solomon has written a lot of stuff uh, regarding Pentecostalism and uh, various topics. So if you want to purchase his books, I will leave uh, a link in the description. Uh, which, which book would you recommend for someone to, you know, start with if... if if they are interested into just uh, reading about what you have written. 
Yes, um, I would recommend the my book published with Paul Grave Macmillan, uh, Pentecostalism and Cultism in South Africa. Pentecost. Uh, it's a it's a good start, and it offers a uh, knowledge of what these movements are and how to deal with these issues. So a lot of things that we discuss today uh, are summarized in that book. Oh, great. Yeah, that's it from us. Uh, catch you some other time. Cheers. Thank you, sir.